This presentation will review intracranial regulation. We will discuss the basic physiological mechanisms that maintain normal intracranial pressure and identify clients at risk for increased intracranial pressure, or IICP. So before we discuss the complexities of intracranial regulation or how our bodies regulate the pressures and volumes in our cranium, we need to go back to basics. So think about when we talk about hemodynamics. These are the pressures in our intravascular system and our heart, and they're increasing and decreasing according to the heart squeezing and the blood vessels dilating or constricting and the amount of blood circulating. But one nice thing about our cardiovascular system is that our blood vessels can adapt and our tissues can adapt. They can stretch and they can constrict. Our blood vessels can constrict and dilate according to the amount of blood or pressure in the system. So now when we talk about intracranial regulation, the amount of blood in our system and the amount of pressure there still comes into play in terms of how that pressure and fluid is regulated. But what's the difference between our skulls and the container of our systemic pressure, or maybe our arms and our legs, for instance? Well, our cranium, our skull, is an inexpandable vault. So while fluctuation in blood pressure or cardiac output might not be cause for concern because we have a lot more room to expand and contract, fluctuations on the pressure in the cranium require much more precise and efficient regulation of pressures. And the cranium's capacity to allow for big or rapid changes in pressure is much less than our cardiovascular system. So what do we need to take into consideration when delving into intracranial regulation? Well, obviously, the fact that the cranium will not expand and contract as pressure changes, but also what's in this cranial vault. So there are three major components to consider. The brain itself, or the brain tissue, blood, and cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF. And these are the three main components in the skull that will be impacted if pressures increase or decrease in the cranium. So to explain this, we use what's called the Monroe-Kelly hypothesis. And this hypothesis states that if the volume of one of these three things increases, the brain, the blood, or the CSF, then one or both of the other two must decrease. So for example, your patient has kidney failure and they miss dialysis, so they are hypervolemic, therefore their blood volume is increased so much that it starts to increase the pressure in their cranium. So because we have too much blood in the cranium, Typically, the easiest and quickest way for the brain to accommodate for this increase in blood volume is to displace some of the cerebrospinal fluid into the subarachnoid spaces. So you can see the brain didn't have to be displaced. That sounds problematic. But the CSF was able to compensate for this extra blood volume that caused an increase in intracranial pressure. So let's think of another example. Your patient has a head injury and the brain tissue becomes inflamed. So the volume of one of our three components, our brain, blood, and CSF, just increased. Our brain tissue size and amount increased. So now we have to look at the blood in the CSF. The cerebral veins will likely dilate, allowing more blood to leave the brain more efficiently. And the cerebral arteries may constrict to not allow as much blood to enter the brain. And again, the CSF may be displaced in the subarachnoid space as well. So this can be a delicate balancing act. We need blood in the brain. We need to perfuse the brain. We need CSF in the brain. And we need our brain to stay in our skulls. But we can't have too much pressure in the brain. So while the body can accommodate for changes in pressure, we need to think about what risks might come with these changes in blood and brain and CSF. So here we can see each of the three components and how they can adapt to increases in intracranial pressure. Now we talked about how the CSF can reduce pressure by being displaced into the subarachnoid space. And we talked about how blood vessels may constrict or dilate to reduce blood flow to the brain. And blood can also be displaced into venous sinuses as well. Sometimes the CSF and blood make accommodations at the same time to adapt to an increased ICP. But now we have that third element, the brain. Our CSF and blood can fairly easily adapt to some changes in pressure, but what can our brain do to adapt to an increase in intracranial pressure? Well, this is what we actually don't want to happen. We don't want our brain tissue to have to accommodate for changes in pressure because the brain compensates by moving or herniation. 
And this is where the brain tissue is forced to move from an area of high pressure to an area of lower pressure. We want our brains to stay in our skulls how they are supposed to be. This is why we prefer that CSF or blood make that accommodation, not our brain tissue. But sometimes our blood and our CSF can't do enough to compensate and the brain tissue is forced to move. And some of these movements or herniations are temporary and they may not even lead to immediate emergencies in our patients. But as the tissue shifts, it could compress a nerve, maybe causing a facial droop or maybe a dilated pupil. However, some herniations are fatal. For example, if the brain herniated downward through the foramen magnum, so remember that's the hole at the base of the skull where the spinal cord connects to the brain. If the brain were to shift down through this hole, this could cut off blood supply to the brain and it could be fatal to that patient. So part of this process of maintaining adequate and appropriate blood flow in the cranium is called autoregulation. The brain regulates its own blood perfusion and it needs to allow enough pressure to perfuse the brain, but we don't want so much pressure that it causes stress on the brain. So this autoregulation can basically handle a pretty broad range of systemic pressures, but there is a limit. And these systemic pressures basically boil down to our mean arterial pressure, our MAP. Remember, MAP is our mean pressure in the arteries, which is key to perfusing our organs and yes, our brains. So if our MAP is on the low end, autoregulation may, may cause cerebral artery dilation. So that will facilitate blood flow to the brain. And if the MAP is really high, these cerebral arteries may constrict a little bit more to reduce the impact of that higher pressure and reduce blood flow to the brain. So ideally, we want to keep the MAP between 70 and 90. And if our MAP is below 70, oftentimes the brain can't autoregulate enough to perfuse the brain adequately. And we'll start to see signs of cerebral ischemia. Remember, ischemia is poor perfusion. So if the MAP is over 150, often the brain cannot accommodate for this high, really, really high, severely high pressure, and the vessels can't constrict anymore to compensate, and therefore the intracranial pressure will increase. So we've been talking about pressures in the brain and increasing and decreasing according to what our CSF blood and brain tissue does. And you can see how an increase in intracranial pressure could impact perfusion and potentially shifting or herniation of brain tissue. But what is this increased ICP or IICP? And how do we determine if it's too high? Well, here we define ICP. So intracranial pressure is defined as the pressure exerted by those three components, brain, blood, and CSF, against the inside of that inexpandable vault. And now we call this IICP or increased intracranial pressure when the pressure in the skull is 20 millimeters mercury or higher and it persists for five minutes or longer. So a normal ICP would fluctuate between five and 15 millimeters mercury and we'll talk about what might cause these fluctuations in ICP. So now we understand the definition of ICP and how this impacts our brains and perfusion to that brain tissue. But one of the biggest reasons we are concerned about ICP in the first place is because we want to make sure our brains are getting perfused with blood. And fortunately, we can measure how well our brains are getting perfused by calculating what's called a cerebral perfusion pressure, or CPP. And the CPP number is basically the amount of pressure that is perfusing the brain and a normal CPP is between 60 and 100 millimeters mercury. So how is this calculated? Well, basically, we take the amount of pressure being delivered to the brain and subtract the amount of pressure in the brain, or that pressure that is essentially pushing back. So the amount of pressure being delivered to the brain is going to be that mean pressure perfusing our tissues, so our mean arterial pressure. Now the pressure pushing back against our MAP is the pressure in our skulls, or the ICP, the intracranial pressure. Now think about this, if there is a low MAP, for instance, that's gonna reduce our CPP because we aren't sending enough pressure to the brain. Or if our MAP is just fine, but our counter pressure, or the ICP pushing back against the MAP is really high, that's going to reduce perfusion as well. So think of it this way, how hard is the heart pushing blood to the brain minus how hard the brain is pushing back.
So bottom line, we need to make sure that the brain tissue is getting blood. So you can see why CPP is the most important factor when we're looking at maintaining the health of that brain tissue. So let's take a look at a couple of examples here. Our first patient has a perfectly normal map, 75 millimeters mercury. However, they had a head injury and their ICP is 22. Remember, increased intracranial pressure is defined as an ICP of 20 or higher for five minutes or longer. So what is this patient's CP CPP? Pause the presentation and consider your answer. The correct answer is 53. 75 minus 22 is 53. So looking at what a normal CPP is, we know that this is low. This patient does not have adequate pressure perfusing their brain tissue. So what do you think needs to be done to help this patient? Now, because our map is normal, we need to take measures to reduce the ICP and get that back down to normal. So if we got our ICP down to 10 millimeters mercury, let's say, now we're only subtracting 10 from 75 and our CPP is within normal range. Let's look at another patient. We have a patient here with a low map of 55 millimeters mercury and a normal ICP of 5 millimeters mercury. What is this patient's CPP? Pause the presentation and consider your answer. Well, 55 minus 5 is 50, so the amount of pressure perfusing the brain is below normal at 50. What would we need to do for this patient? Well, our ICP is normal, so we need to look at getting more pressure to the brain or increasing the MAP. So how do you increase MAP? Well, that's part of our arterial pressure. So giving the patient vasopressors to increase blood pressure to let's say a MAP of 75 would increase this patient's CPP to 70. Now another common term you will hear in addition to CPP is CBF or cerebral blood flow. And both CPP and CBF refer to perfusion of brain tissue, but CPP refers to the amount of pressure perfusing the brain, and CBF, or cerebral blood flow, refers to the amount of blood passing through brain tissue, specifically the amount of blood in milliliters that passes through 100 grams of brain tissue. But either way, CPP and CBF are both referring to how well the brain is getting perfused. Let's take a look at a question. Your patient has a MAP of 70 and an ICP of 20. What is an appropriate nursing intervention? One, continue to monitor, this is normal. Two, take measures to decrease the ICP. Three, take measures to decrease the MAP. Four, take measures to increase the ICP. Pause the presentation and consider your answer. The correct answer is two, take measures to decrease the ICP. So this patient has a CPP of 50, 70 minus 20. So because the CPP is low, we need to address the abnormal number, and in this case, that's the ICP, which is too high. So we need to reduce that counter pressure, that ICP, to improve CPP. Now that we understand ICP and why it's important, let's look at some examples of what would cause ICP to increase. And it can be easiest to categorize these by those three elements in the cranial vault, the brain, blood, and CSF. So looking at the brain first, different types of cerebral edema can increase ICP. Common causes include hydrocephalus, head injuries, or different types of infections. Other trauma to the brain, such as radiation therapy or stroke, can cause inflammation and edema as well. Additionally, brain tumors, masses, and contusions will cause the brain volume to increase and thus increase ICP. Moving from examples of increases in brain volume, let's look over some examples of why blood volume would increase. So if blood is no longer circulating in and out of the brain normally, but spills into the brain tissue, this will increase the total volume of blood in the cranial, cranial vault. So a closed head injury or a stroke causing intracranial hemorrhage would fall into this category. Or what if too much blood is getting to the brain? So for example, vasodilation or hypertension would increase the amount of blood being delivered to the brain. One concept to be aware of here is what causes vasodilation? And in a way, the brain will respond to hypoxia or signs of hypoxia by allowing more blood to get to the brain, by facilitating that blood flow to the brain. So what are signs of hypoxia? not enough oxygen, or too much carbon dioxide, high levels of CO2. So remember, signs of hypoxia lead to allowing more blood to flow into the brain. 
So hypoxia or hypercapnia, high CO2, will cause vasodilation. And that could cause too much blood flow into the brain, increasing ICP. So what else would cause our brains to allow more blood to the brain? Well, we th when we think about fight or flight, that sympathetic nervous response, it involves getting more blood to important organs like our brains, right? So stress responses will also increase ICP by increasing blood flow to the brain. So pain or anxiety, even fevers and physical activity require more oxygen. So we channel more blood to the brain. And increased oxygen demands, such as shivering or seizures, can also increase cerebral blood flow and increase ICP. So still thinking about how blood can increase intracranial pressure, we've talked about how increased blood flow to the brain can increase intracranial pressure. But what if the problem isn't too much blood getting to the brain, but not enough blood leaving the brain? So an obstruction of blood outflow can also cause increased intracranial pressure. When the neck is flexed or hyperextended or tipped to the side, this places pressure on those cerebral veins, not allowing for sufficient outflow. Even rotating the neck to the side or tracheostomy ties that are too tight could impair the outflow of blood. So additionally, tumors or abscesses could impede this outflow. We even look lower than the neck though. When we consider outflow of blood, we need to look at intra-abdominal pressure, intra-thoracic pressure. All of those could also translate into more pressure higher up and reducing venous outflow. So many of your nursing interventions to reduce intracranial pressure can involve patient positioning keeping the head midline, not letting it tip to the side or flex forward, and even reducing flexion in the hips, which will allow for better venous outflow. Increases in our third element, the CSF, can also cause increased intracranial pressure. So increased production, reduced absorption, or other obstructions in the outflow of CSF can cause there to be too much CSF in the brain. So for example, a subarachnoid hemorrhage, or SAH, can cause blockage to subarachnoid spaces and reduce absorption of CSF in the brain.